Candia with Candia Hainsworth Designs, your personalization and embroidery expert. Thank you so much for joining in. Today, we are going to talk about the beginning stages of your business. So let's get started. Okay, so before we move on, I wanted to explain what information will be discussed in this video and who this video was created for. This video was created for anyone who is thinking about or have taken the leap of faith to open a home-based business. The info in this video can be applied to any kind of business, but my intended target was embroidery hobbyists or new embroidery business owners who have considered or who have reached out to me for embroidery mentoring services. My embroidery mentorship services have been revised and updated. This means the first phase has been completely eliminated. However, it's been summarized in this video. These are things that you can do yourself totally on your own, independently, without my assistance. And thereafter, if you'd like to move on with my embroidery mentoring services, you'll be prepared because your foundation will be set in place already. Okay, so let's talk about the stage of your business. If you are under three years of having your business, you are still in the beginning stages of your business. And that is totally okay. Totally okay. And so you have to understand that everyone that you are watching on YouTube that are making it, that uh, are a successful or appear to be successful, it, no matter where they are in their business, they all had a day one. That would be me. That would be anyone else that you are watching who have been in business. We all had a day one, a month one, a year one. And so not accepting or outright ignoring where you are in your business can be very detrimental because uh, you can place unrealistic expectations on your business that really could be ridiculous. Okay, so we all know that there's a big difference between an infant and a toddler. A one-month-old is not at the same stage as a one-year-old, and a one-year-old is not at the same stage as a three-year-old. Makes sense, right? Right. Yes, but it is a difference when operating a business for three years because unlike an infant who will grow regardless to if he or she is nurtured or not, an infant business will not grow if it's not nurtured. You can have a business remain in infant stage for years. Okay, so let's talk about the stages of your business. The administrative stuff. Do you have the proper certificates or permits to operate your business according to your state's guidelines? What would that be? Name registration. Many of my embroidery mentoring students are under the impression that by registering a domain name, that solidifies registering their business. My response is always, not at all. A domain name is the registration of your business name on the internet. Only one person can have a worldwide web name at one time. And so if you register your www.whateverthatis.com, that's going to be yours worldwide. Like candiahainsworth.com is my name worldwide. No one else can register it. However, however, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with your state's registration. Yes, you can register your domain name in a year on a yearly basis, or on a two year basis, or on a five year basis, in some cases, even 10 years. But once again, that has nothing to do with operating a business in the state that you live in. And so I'd recommend that you make sure that your business is compliant with state and federal business laws. And to do so, you should check with your local business licensing offices to make sure that you are doing everything that you're supposed to do. And that starts with registering your business's name properly. Okay, so let's move on to name registration and who needs to register their name. You're going to need to register your name if you are doing business as another name, a name that is not of a true person. Okay, so if you refer to the screen, I have clear definitions on what this means. Number one, what is a fictitious name? A fictitious name is a name under which any person shall do or transact any business in the state which is other than the true name of such person. A fictitious name is commonly referred to as a DBA, which is an acronym for doing business as. Filing a fictitious name registration does not afford or secure any exclusive rights to the name. Number two, who has to file a fictitious name registration? 
any person or entity which is doing business under a name other than the true name must register that fictitious name. For instance, if John Doe is doing business under the name John's Lemonade Stand, John Doe must register the fictitious name John's Lemonade Stand. So that means that if I was doing business as Candia Hainsworth, I would not have to register my name. However, the fact that my business name is Candia Hainsworth Designs meant that I needed to register my business as Candia Hainsworth Designs because the designs makes it a fictitious name. Is that clear? I hope so. Okay, so you're going to go to google.com and you're going to enter the Department of State plus your state. Click on it. And then click on the web link. And then when you are on the website, you want to go to the search box. Familiarize yourself with the website. I think I'm going to go back to Pennsylvania State website because I am familiar with that website. And I know what to look for. But basically, you're going to go to the search box. And then in the search box, you're going to enter fictitious name. And generally, when you do this, what's going to happen is either you're going to be transferred to a page or you're going to be transferred to a link, a list where there's going to be a link. And it's going to allow you to uh, click on it. And either A, you're going to have to download a PDF, or it may just pop up on the screen for you. In this case, I'm just going to click on it, and it's going to pop up on the screen. And every website is going to be different, but in this case, Pennsylvania's is very easy. As you can see, I'm able to complete this form right on the internet, like so. It's going to have the price. And you see the first line is going to be uh, what is going to be the fictitious name, and that's going to be Candia Hainsworth Designs. And then it's going to ask you some other questions. But once again, every website and every state is going to be different. After that, you can print it out, sign it, and send it to them with a money order. If they will not allow you to pay it online, maybe your state will allow it to pay it online. But overall, this is how you find the fictitious name. Once again, by going to Google, entering Department of State, plus your state's name. And then from that point on, you should be able to kind of you know, maneuver your way around the website, <clears throat> excuse me, or get over to the website. And as you can see, Connecticut, their website link came up completely different. It took me to a completely different um, website for uh, entities. But once again, this is how you at least get on the track to finding your state Department of State's website. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about is sales tax ID numbers and employee identification numbers. I want to talk about what is the difference, what are they used for, and basically, do you even need it? Okay, so let's discuss sales tax ID numbers first. States issue a sales tax ID number to give your business permission to charge sales tax. Some states use the federal employee identification number as the sales tax ID number. Some states issue a number separate from the EIN number. So we know now that it's issued by the state, and we also know now that it's used to charge sales tax on your goods. However, did you also know that some places will not even allow you to purchase at wholesale rates without a sales tax ID number? So what happens is when you go onto these websites, they will ask you to fill out an application or a pre-screening, and they will ask you for your sales tax ID number. Some websites will even require you to upload a copy of your sales tax ID certificate. And so this can be helpful also in regards to charging sales tax, but also into getting a wholesale rate in some of the websites that are online. So we have discussed the sales tax ID number. Now let's discuss the employer identification number, also known as the federal employer identification number, 
or the federal tax ID number or the EIN. It is a unique nine digit number assigned by the Internal Revenue Service to business entities operating in the United States for the purposes of identification. And so if you really want to think about it like a social security number for your business, you would be correct because this is going to identify your business, almost like the, the way that you have a social security number that identifies you, even if someone has the same name as you, first, last, middle name, you're not going to have the same social security number. It's the same deal with the business. And this is going to set your business apart from someone else. With all the things you must do when setting up a business, you must decide on its formation. The most popular formations are going to be your sole proprietorship, your LLC, which is a limited liability company, and your partnership. As for me, I'm currently an LLC, but I started out as a sole proprietor, which meant my company was solely ran by me and I was the only one to have rights to its profits. A sole proprietorship is the smallest form of business to register and it's easiest to set up. Most importantly, in my opinion, it's the cheapest way to set up a business, especially if you're running it from home. Okay, we're almost done here. The next thing that we need to discuss is your mailing address. I used to highly recommend renting a mailbox of some sort from the post office or UPS store or one of the private rental companies. But I have found that most of my embroidery mentoring students did not ever use their mailbox, which made me question, did they really need it? Now at Candia Hainsworth Designs at my company, I use my mailbox. I use my mailbox for the non-local customers sending me items to embroider, like a blanket or a jacket or a vest or something. Rather than have them send their items to my home, the mailbox was serving as a middleman. It made it very easy for me just to go and pick up my mail orders or ship out mail orders at the same time. It was an effective way for the transaction to be successful. And lastly, I recommend that you set up a telephone number. Although we live in an email me and text me society, a live representative will always, always trump other options. And that live representative will be you. People will always prefer to speak to someone to place an order or to give a credit or a debit card to, or a human being will always want to speak to another human being when there's a problem. Okay, and so you can't go wrong by setting up a telephone number for your business, especially if it's free. And you can set up a telephone number simply by downloading an app and having calls or text messages routed to your cell phone. And the best part of it all is it's free. Okay, so let's recap. If you're a new or a budding entrepreneur providing services or selling goods from your home to ensure you are operating properly, you should register your business's name with your state. Especially if you are within the United States, you want to register your business's name. You want to let them know what you are doing business as. Okay, and just keep in mind that that does not give you exclusive rights to that name. And so if you have an embroidery shop or a cupcake shop a sewing shop and your name is mary's embroidery you may not be the only one using that name it doesn't give you exclusive rights just because you are registering it you just want to tell them about your mary's embroidery shop that you're running from your home okay and so i recommend that you start off on the right track and make sure that you register your business's name next secure the domain name now, securing a domain name may be a bit, a bit premature, especially if you know that you want to do a website, but you know that you got some time for that. The only reason why I said I, I suggest securing a, a website domain name very early on is because only one person can secure a domain name. And so if you drag your feet on that, it could be very much so that it's not available when you are ready. And because securing a domain name really doesn't cost a lot at all, I suggest give yourself a peace of mind, spend the 15, 20 bucks, 10 bucks, however much it costs and secure the name. And so if you are thinking about it now and it's January and you know you want 
won't be ready to make a website until April, guess what? You don't have to worry about if it's available or not because it's yours. So I suggest securing a domain name um, as early on as after you have secured or registered your business's name with your state. So this way you can make it as close or as similar together or if not the same, if not the same, uh, as best as you can, as quickly as you can. And then we have the formation of your business. Now, if you're a sole proprietorship, you don't have to necessarily register yourself as a sole proprietorship, but if you be want to become a li limited liability company or a partnership, then you do. And you can actually do this on your own with the help of the legal websites that they have out there available with attorneys that are ready to help you and these websites are going to be legal zoom rocket lawyer um if you do not have an, uh, an attorney and you don't wish to hire an attorney then you can go to these uh, websites for help okay and once again these uh, websites are going to be legal zoom or rocket lawyer and i am not an affiliate of either one of them it's just that i know that they can help you there and so this is something that you should look into if you want to uh, make your business a limited liability company or a partnership. The next is the sales tax ID number. Now, the sales tax ID number is going to be if you want to charge or if you are going to be charging tax on your goods or your services. This is also going to allow you to be exempted from getting tax charged onto your items in certain environments, like if you are purchasing a whole bunch of items from a super center. I'm not talking about groceries. I'm talking about if you go to one of your local super centers and you see t-shirts, for example. T-shirt, for example, they're normally five bucks. They're marked down to one and you buy the whole rack. You buy the whole rack and that's the only thing that's on that receipt. Like you don't have personal goods on that seat. Everything on that receipt is regarding your business. Uh, if you register your uh, sales tax ID number with that store, you may be able to be exempted from paying tax. You just want to make sure that your certificate is on file. You can also do this at the fabric stores as well. All right. And so once again, your sales tax ID number is going to allow you to charge tax on your goods or your services is going to allow you to be exempted from paying the taxes on a large portion of items or items if you're buying it locally if you are uh, registered with their store and also it's going to allow you to buy wholesale uh, once again a lot of these places don't even allow you to go into their website unless you have a sales tax id number on file and sometimes the certificate too the next thing is the employer identification number sometimes known as the federal tax id number this is going to be your social security number for your business all right and this is also going to be the number that you can use for your taxes and the number that the bank is going to ask you for when you go to set up a separate bank account for your business so an employer identification number you need it you need it you need it okay the next thing is going to be a mailbox now i gotta tell you a lot of people meaning my embroidery mentoring students some of them have given me pushback because they don't get mail um they don't get mail but you never know you might start you might start getting mail not only that sometimes people meaning your customers want an address they want to know exactly where are you even if it is a p.o box and the ups store for example gives you a street address they want to at least have a go-to place or something opposed to just someone existing on the web so if you're not planning on using your home address having a p.o box or even a street address that's not your actual home will be helpful all right and so with me i use my mailbox and once again i do accept customers sending things to me all the time for me to embroider then i send it right back out i really like the idea of when i am printing out a return label i can use my p.o box but once again that is purely up to you you would have to uh, think about that and how it will work out for you if you think that you really don't need it then save yourself the 50 bucks it costs i think a year every six months or so save it and put it towards something else the telephone number you definitely need a telephone number 
And I know that we live in a world where we like to text and we like to send emails and that is totally okay. But I am telling you, it is almost impossible to have a business where every now and again, something goes wrong. Every now and again, a customer will call you because they didn't get their order. And guess what? You put it inside of the, uh, the tracking number inside of the computer and the computer is telling you that it has been shipped. Okay, every now and again, somebody's going to say, well, can I talk to you? Can I speak to you? And when you are doing consultations and, 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 and so forth, you are more likely to seal the deal when you are talking to a person versus texting and emailing and so forth. I'm not suggesting that you can't seal the deal and have a successful transaction. I am just suggesting it is more likely to occur to be more successful if you can speak to the person on the phone they can hear your voice people like to know that there is a human being a lot they like to develop a rapport a relation so just think of it that way i think that having a telephone number especially if it's free these calls are routed to your your cell phone you can even um set up your cell phone to the point where like what my cell phone is set up i know exactly who's calling me on what line i have an office line i have a business line so i know if it's the office line is something administrative um a bill issue or something like that and if it's my um regular 733 for 300 that's more than likely somebody wants to place an order so you can set it up where it can chime differently. And once you have all of these things set up, now you are ready if you want to join my embroidery mentoring program. This is so much helpful at this point, doing it this way, opposed to having to do these steps with you. You can have it all set and done, and you are ready to jump full blown into the embroidery mentoring program. If you're not ready to jump into the mentoring program, guess up. You are still set up, my dear. You are still set up. You are ready to go on to the next phase of developing your business. And at least now you are set up properly. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you have not done so, please click and subscribe to my channel and hit that little bell so you can be notified when I upload videos. And you can find me on Facebook at candyahainsworth.com. You can also find me in the group Embroidery Boss on Facebook as well as the group Dollar Tree Moneymakers and on Instagram. And until then, I'll see you next time. Bye!